Every year, approximately 96,000 students study A-level maths. If you look at the top universities, Oxford, Cambridge and Imperial, they take on roughly 100 students per course. Of these 96,000 pupils, about 10% of them are going to achieve A star, so around 9,600. If you add on all of the international students, of which thousands and thousands are taken into the top universities every year, you can kind of see that it's not just grades that get you into these top universities. In their admissions report in 2019, Oxford reported that 21,515 people applied for entry. Of those 21,000 pupils, 3,840 were offered a space with 3,303 students attending. If you look at this tiny fraction that actually get offered places, keeping in mind that the only people applying for Oxford are people with the grades to get in, then how do they decide which of those 18% of the students will actually get offers? It can't just be based on grades. Over the course of my teaching time, I have had students that have predicted three or four A stars at A level. These are the best grades you can possibly get, and yet they don't even get interviews at places like Imperial, Oxford or Cambridge. So it brings us back to that question again. How do these top universities decide on which of those 18% are actually going to get an offer? And I want to answer that, and in order to answer that we need to look at exactly what universities are looking for in their students. And in order to know that, we need to look at how are universities ranked? Remember, rankings are everything for universities. Universities are ranked in the following ways. The first way is the percentage of graduates that are employed within six months of graduating. The second is the actual average income of the graduates after graduating. And lastly, student satisfaction. Now, student satisfaction, it's hard to determine from an interview if you're going to be a satisfactory student or not, although there probably are some warning signs. So what exactly do universities want from their students? Well, first of all, they want students that are not going to drop out. Every dropout really negatively impacts the university's ranking. They also want students that are going to go above and beyond in order to get a good job because that adds to their rankings with the average income and the percentage that are employed. Now, the universities do a lot to help you with this by offering internships and their connections. However, it relies on the student themselves actually going out and applying for these things and being successful in those applications. They also want students with extra skills, extracurricular activities that are useful. And lastly, they want students that are very good at interviewing. Why? Because all of those things that I've just mentioned make it more likely to be successful in an interview. So if you're going on to do a graduate program or if you're going on to get a job, these things will all make your life easier and more and increase your chances of actually getting employed or getting the position. In short, of course, academic ability is very, very useful and it is important. However, there are so many academically gifted people, people that can study really, really hard and get those top grades. So in order to get to these top universities or even into the university of your co uh, choice or into a competitive degree like medicine and engineering, you have to stand out from the others. And the best ways to do this is by developing those skills, but how exactly can you set yourself up for success? A good way to show determination and a go-getter attitude is by developing additional skills and hobbies in your spare time. This will A, make you more interesting. Keep in mind that if an interviewer likes you, they're more likely to give you a recommendation and therefore give you an offer. And they also show that you have this kind of independent mindset that you're willing to put in time in your spare time to develop skills. It's much better than, let's say, someone that just sits around watching Netflix all day. It also helps you display passion if you're willing to actually go out and learn something all by yourself. And now, when it comes to actually making these skills relevant to your occupation, that it's not necessary. For example, if you can play music but you're going into a medical degree, it still has a benefit. But if you can, try and relate these skills, interests and hobbies to your degree. So let's say you want to go into web development at university. It's a good idea to try and produce some web developments and like websites and apps on your own. If you're going into math, science and statistics, it's a good idea to learn programming languages like Python and R and build some mathematical models just to test them out. It shows genuine interest, passion, and it does give you a bit of a head start. Some other things that can help you is getting in touch with a professional in the field. Having a reference, let's say you want to go and do medicine at Oxford University and you have a reference from a doctor, that's a pretty good example of you going out of your way, building a connection with someone, and that someone is someone that thinks that you're going to be a good doctor someday. It's a very, very good idea. Visiting the university as well, it shows that you have this interest, and again, you're independently thinking. Remember, university is going to be extremely independent. They won't teach you everything. You're gonna to have to do a lot of reading and work independently. 
You can also attend camps, lectures, etc. based in your field. There are code camps. There are maths related things as well and also for medicine and all these other degrees also. And lastly, which is a really, really important thing, even though I put it last, but it's because I have a lot to talk about, is writing a strong personal statement. Now, communication is the one skill I would say is completely universal. Every adult should be good at this. No matter what job you apply for, no matter what industry you're in, you're going to have to interact with other people. And communication is a huge part of that, shockingly. Being able to write well, being able to sell yourself, being able to sell someone on an idea. Now, most adults don't have this, right? Which is why, if you think about it, when people get applications on jobs, most of them are thrown away. So let's say if I'm applying to become an engineer. Now, the only people applying to become engineers are people with engineering qualifications. And most of us are going to have pretty much the same score, the same grade, because there's only four, like three or four grades that you can get at university, depending on what kind of course you do. So what, how do they determine which CVs they're throwing out? It's based entirely on the personal statement. So you need to be really, really good at writing those personal statements, because again, the people applying for uni the university you want to go to have the same grades as you, more than likely. So how do you stand out? Well, you need to actually set yourself up for success. During your first few years, over your summers, you should be trying to use your extra time building skills and having experiences that you can write about in your personal statement and then constructing your personal statement with evidence to really sell yourself. Show off your good qualities, but again, show evidence. You can't say you're determined if you don't have any extra hobbies or extracurriculars. You can't say that you are an independent thinker if you've never independently thought about anything in your life. Even if it's something like looking up philosophies and politics, that is something you can write about. And I promise you, you can write about anything, which again is another useful skill. So once again, the best time to start this process is right now. I don't care if you're in year 10 or even in year 7 or you're in year 13. You, have, you need to do this right now. And the reason why I say this is if you get to a week before your personal statement's due, how are you going to develop a new skill or have a new experience? It's very unlikely. Whereas if you're starting going into year 12, you have a whole year and a bit to develop some skills and to have some opportunities. There are, t it tends to happen that in year 12, your school will offer university open days and universities will also offer open days as well on their websites if you're a bit more you know, practical. The thing is, that only happens in year 12 really. So when you get into year 13, you can't say, oh, I visited university when you didn't because in year 12 is when you are supposed to do it. So you have to really have this foresight. Now, I know that this sounds a bit too overwhelming and A-levels are stressful enough as it is, but don't worry, I am here to help. With the tuition that I currently offer, I package in advice and guidance on all of these things, on writing a personal statement, using your spare time efficiently, and being able to just kind of book different university-specific exams or book university open days and all of this kind of stuff. So what I mean by university-specific exams? Well, depending on what course you want to do and what university, you may have to sit, for example, a medical entrance exam for uh, doc uh, for doctors, you may have to sit an engineering exam or the MCAT for maths. All of these things you have to take into consideration and sit them in advance. You need to sit them a year before you actually do the um, course in and of itself. So, and also how to write a great personal statement, of course. What extracurricular activities you can do to maximise your odds of getting that delicious offer. So if you're interested in this package or just receiving some extra help, I encourage you to either join the Discord and message me there or email me. Both of those links are in the description and we can have a small chat, no strings attached, no guarantees, and it's completely free as well, about what your options are. So I hope that kind of sums up why grades are not going to be the only thing that determine what university you get into or what degree. Now I know some of you are probably looking at this thinking, well, what if I don't want to go to Oxford? I'm going to point out that A, you should aim for the best universities possible, which isn't always Oxford and Cambridge, but also all universities have a huge amount of competition for their spaces. If you want to do a relatively well-known degree, like engineering, computer science, or anything like that, you will have to compete with other people. You will have to write a really good personal statement. But other than that, I hope you have a wonderful day, and I will see you in the next one.